Reverse the paradigm of performance. In other words, celebrate what he's done for you. Don't celebrate what you've done for him. I mean, why would you celebrate what you've done for him? How's it possibly going to be enough? Didn't we learn anything from the story of Babel? You're only going to get so high the tower's going to fall down. That's one of the principles of the story. You can't make it. It's not possible to build the tower to heaven. So heaven has to come to you. That's the contrast of the Jacob in the wilderness story where the ladder and there's angels going up and down on the ladder and God standing at the top of the ladder and Jacob wakes up and goes, man, I'm in the presence of God. Did you notice he's in the presence of God, but where's God? Top of the ladder. And then comes Jesus in John chapter one and he talks to Nathaniel and he goes, oh, look, Israelite in whom is no guile. And Nathaniel goes, oh man, you must be the son of God. You must be the one. And Jesus goes, you're convinced I'm the one because I spotted you under a tree? He goes, man, hold on to your hat, Nathaniel. You're going to see great things. How great? You're going to see the angels of heaven ascending and descending upon the son of man. And it wasn't lost on Nathaniel what that meant. Me and dad aren't standing at the top of the ladder anymore. Dad and I are standing at the bottom of the ladder because you guys can't climb ladders to get to heaven. So heaven descended a ladder to come to you. We're not going to elevate hell into heaven. But Jesus has brought heaven down into our hell. He has refashioned our wilderness into a garden. That's the end game of the book of Revelation. We get kicked out of one garden and we go through a bunch of hell. And we end up in a city that looks like a garden with rivers and trees and gates are wide open and the, the lamb is the light. Don't, let's, let's flip this. Let it stop being about what I do. Let it start being about what he does. Embrace his love as equipment to love others. That's, that's the key, man. If I know I'm loved, I'll be able to love other people. And then this last one is, was just my testimony. Be unwaveringly convinced of how loved you are. That's, that's where I'm getting. I'm unwaveringly convinced that he loves me. And that has given me the most peace of anything that I have ever had in ministry and in life. I cannot... I waver on a lot of stuff, but I cannot be convinced God's not fond of me. And in that is the greatest source of my strength. And I think it's all of us. And everybody has access to that. You have as much of that as you want. I mean, you, or as little as you want. Be unwaveringly convinced of how loved you are. A couple verses more from 1 John 4. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has seen God at any time. Oh, now it looks like we just contradicted a whole night's worth of teaching. Because I thought, <laughs> right? Yeah, look at that. Nobody's seen God at any time. John takes the thought that every person has that reads his letter and goes, it's impossible to be able to see God. And he describes how that's not necessarily true. No one has seen God any time. If we love one another, where's God? He's in us. So what did John do? He goes, you, you've always heard no one sees God. I got news for you. When you express the love that's where God lives. So stop looking for God through signs, wonders, and miracles. Stop looking for God through a prophetic word. Stop looking for God through a revival. Stop looking for God through a ministry. Stop looking for God through a sermon. And start looking for God in the eyes of the person next to you that you don't want to love. Because I promise you, that's where he lives. You want to see what God looks like? Look at your neighbor. That's John's message. We sit around all the time going, I wish I could see God. I wish I'd have a move of God. And we don't want to love the person next to us. Don't ever tell me you want a revival. You can't love somebody you walk past. Because you don't know what a revival is. Don't tell me you want a move of the Spirit. And you walk right past somebody. Step over them on, the, on your way to prosperity. Because they're in the way. They're not God's favored people. Let's be careful what side we fall on in the world of who's favored and who's not. Who gets it and who doesn't. Because I can guarantee you, Jesus is going to fall on the side of whoever's getting stepped on. It's just the nature of a man who knows how to lay himself down on crosses. I mean, to have that kind of heart is the nature of a man who goes, wherever the oppressed are, that's where I'll be. Wherever they're getting stepped on, that's where I'm going to be. That's where you can guarantee I'll be hanging out. You want to see what God looks like? Don't look any farther than that. You don't have to look in the, in the hallowed halls. Just go. You can usually just go look in the ghetto. Go find somebody. It's not got to be that stark. Just be somebody nearby. But express that love. That's how we know. No one has seen God at any time. But if you'll love one another, God abides in us. His love's been... Look at this. There's His love perfected. That's what God looks like. Because what did He just tell you? God is love. What's He going to tell you in verse 16? God is love. 
So that leads me here. This is where we land. We have become the window through which people see God. God is love, and when we love, we put God on display. God is love. But that doesn't describe what love is. And man, it can be so hard to describe. I mean, if you, it sounds easy, but just try to define it. Okay, like get out a piece of paper and go, love, and then define it. You know, hmm. you know you, you come up with a few adjectives, but it's really hard to land. Apostle Paul gave us a list of what love is and isn't. So here's the best we can do. Insert God into the definition and maybe we get close. Here's your hint. They're all going to look like Jesus. God is love. So whatever we can find love is, then we've found God, right? 1 Corinthians 13, this is it. Love is patient. Love is kind. All right, time out. Don't read it that way anymore. God is love. So whatever love is, let's just switch the word. God is love. Love is. So God is. God is patient. God is is kind. God is not envious. God is not boastful. God is not arrogant. God is not rude. Dear Lord, do we need a revival of that? If you want a revival, let's have a revival of God is not rude. That would be a great place to start. God does not insist on getting his own way. The God I had created in my mind was only going to get his own way. And that's how you ought to preach him. God's going to have his way. Love doesn't insist on having its own way. God's not walking around in our lives going, you're going to do it my way or the highway, bud. You can't call God as love and then God is stubborn at the same time. God is love. God doesn't insist on his own way. God's not irritable. God's not resentful. God doesn't rejoice in wrongdoing. He rejoices in the truth. You know what else he can do? He can bear all things you hand him. He can believe all things that you need for him. He can hope all things with you and he can put up with whatever you go through because he endures all things. That's love. Love never ends because God never ends. So I don't know how to define love. Paul did a pretty good job. If God is love, and I don't know how to define love, then I don't know how to define God any better than, say, Jesus. But if you need a list, this is a pretty good place to start. So just kind of dwell on this for a little while and go, maybe that's what God looks like. Couple that with what Jesus looks like, you're going to get pretty close to those clearest picture of God that I can possibly paint. I don't know what his height and weight, but I know his expression. That's God as love pretty clear picture to me. Father, thank you. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your grace. You get to be compassionate to whoever you want to be compassionate to. You get to be gracious to whoever you want to be gracious to. And if that was all I had, you'd be, I am who I am. And I could have you be a bunch of stuff, but that's not it. That's not the end. That's not the stopping point of revelation. There's taller mountains than that. There's peaks that we're still trying to get to the top of called God is love. We tried tonight to make the picture clear. It's as clear as I can do, but you are in the business of making it so much clearer. So I pray you go to work in all of our hearts to make us unwaveringly convinced that you love us and that you love others. Teach us how to express that because when we do, we become a conduit by which the world experiences the love of God and a window into the heartbeat of the Father. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.